Please be seated. <clears throat> Our scripture passage for today is from the book of Psalms, chapter 19. Before we read this, let us pause for a moment in prayer. Good and gracious Father, we come today and we thank you for the holy word that you have given us. Lord, we thank you that you have given us your law, your commandments, and your instructions to guide and direct our lives. But Father, we know we can understand none of these things that you have revealed to us unless the spirit that first inspired these scriptures would inspire us again as we read. Father, send that spirit among us now, Lord, into our minds and into our hearts, that we may hear, that we may read, and that we may understand your will for us. Lord, bless this holy reading of your holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. After we read this, there will be a brief moment of quiet meditation to follow. This is Psalm 19. Listen now to the word of the Lord. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, much, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them have no dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to do a little, little quick survey here, and I don't even know if I need to ask this question, but who among you, when you get some spare time to sit down and relax and just uh, have a few moments to yourself, who among you do you take that time to read legal documents? Anybody, anybody, when you just need to relax, pick up a big, thick law book, like maybe environmental law or like something like OSHA, the like requirements from OSHA, and just, just take a few minutes just to relax and read through those and just, oh, just let the words pour over you and sink into you and, and relax your soul. No, you don't. You don't do that. Nobody does that. Nobody likes to read legal text. Nobody likes to read law books. In fact, even when we need to read some legal text, we don't read it. I'm, I'm talking about that uh, little user agreement that you have on the Internet for all these websites you go on or for some software you download. It's got this terms of service or this legal agreement that you agree to, and it's about five pages you scroll through of little tiny writing, and we none of us read it. We just click agree at the end. And as we're clicking agree, some of us are like, well, hope there's nothing bad in here. 
hope I'm not going to find out later that I've got to give my firstborn child over to this company now, and it's in the small print that I didn't want to read. We don't like to read it because, well, it's boring. It's some of the most boring reading you'll ever find in your life is reading the law or legal documents or law books. They're, 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 they're voluminous. They're, they're convoluted. They're dry. They're technical. In fact, there's, there's a lot of words that I could use to describe law writing and legal writing. But the one word we would never use to describe legal writing is beautiful. We don't ever call it beautiful. It's never something that we read and, and find, uh, like say, there's a wonder to it, an awe, or, or it inspires our soul. No one's going to take, you know, chapter 19, subsection 12, of part A and, and get it tattooed on their arm. Like, man, this really changed my life. i got to read this, this, this legal document out here to you. It just doesn't do it. It's, it's, it's not beautiful. I mean, most of our laws are pretty good. Some of them, if you read through them a little backwards, some make no sense at all. Some are actually kind of productive, but none of them, even the best of those laws, would be considered beautiful. But what if the law was beautiful? What if the law was, was written in such a way to inspire the readers? What if it was written and presented in such a way that, that we wanted to study about it, that we wanted to talk about it, that, that it brought us a lot of joy in our life, that it brought us this, this uplift and, and, and inspired us and it gave us direction and it gave us strength? Another law, in other words, what if the law was written for somebody other than lawyers? Because that's really why the law is boring. It's, it's written by and for lawyers. But what if the law was written for, for poets or musicians? Or what if the law was, was written in order for carpenters and doctors and teachers to, to understand and get a lot out of it? What if it was written so salesmen and gardeners could read and be guided and inspired? What if the law was something we like to read? Something that we love to obey. Something that we enjoyed in our life. Well, that's actually the kind of law that we get here in Psalm 19. Psalm 19 is it's a, it's a psalm of praise. It's a category in the praise. And this one is also written by King David like most of the psalms are. And in this psalm, King David is praising the law of God. He's talking about the law of God and how great it is and how wonderful it is that we have this law that God has given us. This is what he says about the law. The law of God is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of God are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing of the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The ordinance of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And He says, more are they to be desired than gold, even fine gold, sweeter than honey, sweeter than the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by this law is your servant warned, and in keeping your law, Lord, there is great reward. The law, David says, is good to have. It's great. This law is awesome. There, there are so many benefits they are to obeying and knowing and keeping God's law. And I think we know this. All of us, we know this. We know the law is good. We know we should obey it. We know that we should keep it. And we know that the law is there not to punish us, but to protect us. I know when I was a, when I was a kid, we used to always play these pickup football games in the backyard. And we had no referee. right? So we had to keep the law of the game ourselves. And I can tell you, almost every single game we played ended in an argument. We didn't get to finish the game. We never got to finish the game because we were complaining, oh, you only tagged me with one hand. No, I tagged you with two. No, your foot was out of bounds. No, it wasn't. It was right there in bounds. Oh, you didn't catch it. No, I caught it. And there, this big fight breaks out over the football game. We never got to finish it. And the reason was we didn't have a referee. We didn't have someone there to properly impose the laws of the game. And what that teaches us is that the laws and the keeping of the law is there to protect the game. It doesn't interfere with the game. It doesn't get in the way of the game. The game is not possible unless the rules are there. 
And the same is true of life. The rules that God has given us, the rules that He has put upon us, His laws, His ways, and His commandments are not there to interfere with life. It's to protect life. It's to protect my life. It's to protect your life. It's to protect my property. It's to protect your property. It's to protect me being able to seek God out. And it's to protect you being able to seek the Lord as well. And I think we know this. We all know this, but at the same time, we, well, we run into a conflict with the rules sometimes. Because we know that the rules and that the laws are good, but we also know that sometimes, well, they interfere with what I want to do. That's just kind of part of being a sinner. There's some times where God says, you can't do this, and our answer is, yeah, but I really want to do that. I mean, I really had this idea, I really had my heart set on doing this thing, God, but now you're telling me I can't do it. And so it's hard sometimes to see how good the law is because the law seems to always be holding us back. It's this interference in life. It's an obstacle. But that's not the way David sees the law. That's not the way he praises the law we hear in Psalm 19. All David can talk about is the benefits of the law and the goodness of it. And he says the law is so good, it's so valuable, it's more valuable than gold. And that was the most, most valuable thing they had, the most valuable precious metal that existed. It was gold. And he says, this is so valuable, it's more valuable than the most refined gold that you can get. And, and the law is actually so sweet, it's sweeter than honey on your tongue. It's sweeter than the drippings of the honeycomb. And see, what David knew is he knew that the law was precious because it teaches us the most important knowledge a human being can acquire. That's the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge of right and wrong. The knowledge between what is good for us and what is bad for us. And everybody wants to live a good life. I mean, by definition, we all seek the good life. Even people who, who don't know the Lord and don't even know right from wrong, in their hearts, they are seeking what they think is a good life. But how can we even seek a good life out if we don't know what good is? How can you say that we've truly lived a good life if we have no idea what good even is? And we can't tell the difference between what is good for us and what is bad for us. What is the path of righteousness and what is the path of evil? That's why David says your law is more valuable than gold. It's the most valuable thing that we can possess because this is what teaches us how to live a good life. It says even more than this, your servants warned. The law warns us all the time. The ways of God warns us all the time. It, it warns us away from evil. So yeah, the law does hold us back. It holds us back all the time. It holds us back from doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord. But if that was all to the law, if that's all we had, then that would be plenty of reason to praise the law and to praise the ways of God. But David takes this a step further because he doesn't just see law, the law in the law of God, the perfection of God and the ways of God and the instruction of how we can live a good and right life. There's something else David sees in the law. He sees beauty. He sees beauty in the laws and decrees of God. He starts his psalm out by praising nature. This is what he says. The heavens are telling the glory of God. And the firmament proclaims His handiwork. The heavens are declaring the glory of God. And the skies above are declaring His glory. So David's looking up at, this, at the natural world. The world that God made. He's looking up and he sees the sun and he, the stars and the moon in heaven. And he can see that it's all declaring the glory of God. That it's, it's, it's majestic, it's powerful, it's beautiful. But it's not just wonderful to look at. It's also talking to us. The natural world that God has made is also speaking to us. This is what he says in verse 2. He says, day to day pours forth speech. And night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. It's all day, 
all day creation is talking. He says, it's day to day it pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. So every day there's words being spoken by this world around us. Every night there's knowledge that's being imparted in the very night itself. And it says it goes to the very ends of the earth. This is being declared. So not only in all times, but in all places. Everywhere you go, everywhere we can see the stamp of God and His creation is His hand. There is speaking to us. It's speaking to us. It's declaring things to us. It's declaring the goodness of God and it's declaring His glory and it's declaring His ways to us. And David continues just, just marveling at the works of creation and he, and he talks about the sun. He says, In the heavens He has sent a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom from His canopy, like a strong man that runs its course with joy. And it gives us just this wonderful, this beautiful description of the son, comparing him to a bridegroom. And that might not make sense to a lot of us, because when we go to weddings, we're often, we're not looking at the bridegroom. Right, you know the part of the wedding where the bride comes out and everybody stands up and the wedding music plays? What do we all do? We all turn around and we look at the bride coming down. How many of you have looked at the groom? How many of you stop and take to look not at the bride, but look at the groom? Now, every time I like to look at the groom, I like to see the expression on his face when he sees his bride for the first time coming out in her, in her bridal dress. And uh, every once in a while, you'll see some fear and panic, you know. But that's not usually the case. Usually when you're seeing the groom, seeing his, his bride for the first time, his face is the only way you can describe it is beaming. I mean, he's got this big smile on his face. His eyes are wide. There's this radiance about him. And that's the way David talks about the sun. The sun comes out in this radiance like a groom that looks at his bride for the very first time. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to behold. And creation that we get in this psalm is not the passive thing that we talk about as creation. When we, we talk about the world around us, we like the rocks and the trees and the river, they, they, they're silent. They don't say anything. We don't talk to them. They don't talk to us. We can't learn anything from them. And that, that's just the world that, we, that we've constructed and lived in. And we don't, like, you don't talk to trees. That's pagan nonsense. Trees don't tell us anything. But in this psalm, we've got creation doing something very different. Creation's talking, it's speaking. Words are at night, words going out in the day, words going out to the end of the earth. The heavens are declaring. The sky is proclaiming. It's teaching us about the glory of God. But it's also teaching us about God's law. God's law, God's ways, God's commandments written in the fabric of creation. The great Protestant theologian John Calvin in his Institutes of the Christian Religion said that everything that we need to know about obeying God and following His commands and knowing who He is and knowing His glory, every single bit of that we can find from observing the natural world and reasoning within our minds. He said it's all there. And the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans said the same thing. He says, God's attributes are clearly seen in the things that God has made. So we are without excuse if we say we're ignorant of God's commands and laws. See, there, there's, there's teachings all around us. There's words being spoken. And the only reason we can't hear is because our eyes fail to see, our ears fail to understand and to hear. And our hearts and our minds don't perceive all we need is clear vision. All we need to see is through innocent, unstained eyes. And we could hear what creation is telling us. Of course, we don't have innocent eyes. We don't have unstained eyes. A veil has been cast over our sight. It's one called sin. And we all have it as part of our fallen nature. That's why we can't just look at creation anymore and hear God's glory. We can't look at creation anymore and know God's law. But if we didn't have sinful eyes, we would see. And we would understand. Have you ever wondered, though, why God never gave, a commandment, gave the commandments to Adam and Eve? The law didn't show up in Genesis. 
the law didn't show up until way, way down there in Exodus and, and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. But when God created the world, He didn't give Adam and Eve a law. He only had one command, don't eat this tree. But He didn't give the law out. And some people like to speculate and say the reason why God didn't give the law out was because everything was being permitted to Adam and Eve. But I think the reason why God didn't give the law out to him is because he didn't have to. Adam and Eve were looking with innocent eyes. Adam and Eve were looking at eyes that at the very beginning were sinless eyes. And they could see God's laws, God's commandments, God's glory, everything they needed to know written on the frame of creation. It's always been God's preferred method of communication. It's not been the written word. It's been through this, this work of art that we call the universe. All through this creation, day to day, night to night, God's law being proclaimed. And not just proclaimed, it's being obeyed. Anybody ever wonder why Nature is so inspiring. Why well, nature can be so beautiful. I think there's a lot of reasons for it, but mainly the reason why we find nature so inspiring and beautiful is because nature is obedient. Nature is doing what nature is supposed to do. Nature is obeying the laws of God as it has been given to her. The reason why the sun in the sky is so radiant is because the sun is acting like the sun is supposed to. The sun is obeying the laws of God, and obeying the laws of God is radiant. The reason why the stars are sublime is because the stars are acting like stars are supposed to. The reason why the ocean is serene is because it's acting like the ocean is supposed to. The reason why bird songs are charming or the early morning mist that clings to the ground just there at the break of dawn is so haunting is because the birds in the mist are obeying God. The reason why the natural world is so full of beauty is because the natural world is obeying the laws of God. And the law of God doesn't just make things good. The law of God makes things beautiful. Now, it's kind of hard to get our heads around that the law can be beautiful. Well, I think because when, when human beings make laws, we don't make them beautiful. Too often when human beings make things, we make things because they're efficient and they're economic and they're quick and they're cheap and they're easy. Take, for instance, when we want to move water from one place to another. What does man do? We lay pipe. And it's very efficient, it's very cheap. It gets water from one place to another. But what does God do when He wants to move water from one place to another? He makes a river. Okay? And pipes are ugly. That's why we bury them in the ground, and that's why we hide them behind the wall. Okay? Nobody builds a vacation home by a pipeline. Nobody wants to go to vacation by a pipeline. Liz and I are hoping to go to the mountains tomorrow, and we're not going to a pipeline. Because it's ugly. No one says, yeah, I'm going to spend my time sitting on the porch drinking coffee and watching this big metal pipe rust. But a river, a river is amazing. Because a river is obedient. When man makes a law, he makes it dry and dull and boring and technical. But when God makes a law, he makes a river. When God makes a law, He speaks through the beauty and the wonder of the things that He has made. And that includes us too. Just as the natural world owes its beauty to its obedience, we too would make our lives beautiful if we were also obedient. It's not just the good life that God promises us, it's a truly beautiful life as well. We too could be as radiant as the sun if only we were as obedient as the sun. We too could be as sublime as the stars, as serene as the ocean, as charming as the bird song, and as peaceful as the morning mist. 
we also could have a life of beauty if only we too would echo with our life these words from the psalm. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. To God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen.